Fantastic. Hello, everyone. For those that don't know me, my name is Vanessa Jean, and I'm so excited to have Elizabeth Ashley with us tonight. Liz has been a friend of mine for a number of years now. I don't know. Our worlds collided and we rose in love and I never looked back. And um, <laughs> she's been a beautiful, you know, melody woven into my heart song for that time. And I feel like we've come together beyond time and space. And for that, I am forever grateful. So thank you, Liz. When we spoke about tonight and tonight's topic, I really wanted to feed everyone um, and nourish everyone with the wisdom of Melissa, her chemistry, her song, her story, the ancient lineage that ties her with us and us with her, the part within us that connects with the inner priestess, the magic weaver, the one who sits by her cauldron and creates her life from future possibilities, yeah? So though Melissa is magical, she also has phenomenal chemistry and as a, as a psychologist, um, that's, that, that were my official, my original qualifications. When I was working with clients, Melissa and Frankincense were powerful allies as I was helping people to come back to their light, come back to their truth, come back to their joy, their natural state of joy. And um, I feel like she can be very underused and undervalued, maybe because of her price tag. But I think mostly because people don't know how much they can value her. You know, when we don't understand the value of something at an energetic level as well, it's difficult for us to open up our wallets and, and nourish ourselves with something. And yet we don't bat an eye for our children or our loved ones, right? So Melissa has a powerful story to tell us, as Liz will share with you. She's been writing her book for the last five years on Melissa and it's taken her on her own initiation path. And I'll let her share with that. But first I want to begin and open with one of my favourite deck of cards channeled by Liz, Tongue of the Trees. When Gurgle, her dear friend, asked her to translate these, I don't think she knew what she was getting herself into. <laughs> And, you're not kidding <laughs> <laughs> and um and the plants decided to come through in a really yummy way more like po prose and poetry so here is melissa bringing the gift of joy and let me read what liz channeled through for this imagine there's a part of you untouched by the trials of life a space like a meadow heavenly covered by glorious flowers. Perhaps it existed in your dreams where the roses and crocuses grow. There's a place where happiness lies and where calmness is all you know. Birds sing sweetly in the trees. Butterflies dance through the grass. Cloudless skies house a generous sun and the harvest sways in the fields. I remember when we were together before worries seized your heart, before trauma ripped your insides out and triggered a darker existence to start. Take a moment, quiet one, and think back. Notice how your spirit remembers and lifts as it returns to the joy of running barefoot and rejoicing in Earth's simple gifts. It's the kind of stuff they don't teach us while we're studying clinical aromatherapy. Hey, guys. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we spend a lot of time in the chemistry and, and diving into um, what we need. I mean, we need that, right, to work with ourselves and work with our clients. But what manifests physically is first birthed from somewhere deep within us, right? So we need to address the emotional, the mental, the spiritual because this beautiful physical vessel of ours inhabits spirit, inhabits a light that is great, grand, huge. And it's time for us to let our light get really big so we can be the light that penetrates the darkness in the world at this time. So without further ado, Liz, hand on heart, so grateful you are here. Let's journey with you into Melissa and her beautiful world. I love you. Thank you for being here. No pressure then. <laughs> how, do I, how on earth do I follow that? <laughs> well, 
let's see if I can share my screen because I do have some slides not only to help with the the imagery of Melissa but also so I don't forget where I'm going so let's see if this works so here I am, and I want to say thank you for being here. Thank you to Vanessa, who I feel 100%, 110% is the same about you as you do about, I, about me. And I am so grateful for all the support you've given me over the last year, where frankly, I have been through hell doing this work. Um, so she talks about it as if it's yummy, 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 but there's not very much yummy about what's happened to me over the last year. It's been very soul searching, very dark, real shamanic work. Um, and it's difficult not to commun not to confuse how hard the bee shamanism is, which is what I've had to learn to do to understand the priestesses to the essential oil. So what I'm going to begin with is the essential oil and its chemistry, and then talk about the priestesses as a separate in, um, entity. Otherwise, you start to think, my goodness, I'm not going anywhere near that oil. It sounds horrific. So, <laughs> so first of all, you can see on the screen my beautiful stag, the secret healer. And actually, the secret healer, the stag has taken on a a different dimension actually through this work because it's also of course the um the sign of artemis the goddess and uh, um the bee priestesses were priestesses of demeter but also of artemis of ephesus so it's very strange that i would be called to talk to her so who am i to talk about it so I began my professional journey into aromatherapy in 1993. I um, was born into what I say is aromatherapy royalty, really. My mum was one of the founder members of the International Federation of Aromatherapists. She was trained by Pat Patricia Javis. She is a tremendous clairvoyant and astrologer in her own right. It was that work that led her to decide that she wanted to find a way to try and heal the people who were coming in so much pain. She used to see a lot of old ladies with very bad arthritis and rheumatism. And she said, right, I'm going to see what I can do to find a way to make these people better. And she went into a bookshop the one day, or we all did, and I was marauding as I do. And a book fell out and fell on her foot and really hurt her foot. And when she looked down, it was a book by Patricia Davis. And she said, well, that's a sign. I'm going to go. She went home and she said to my dad, I'm going to learn this aromatherapy. And he went, what's that? She said, I don't know. I think we'll find out. <laughs> and then she did. And so, yeah, she went on to be one of the founder members. Years later, their um, marriage sadly broke down and she would go on to meet to marry another aromatherapist who was a professional chemist a chemistry teacher and also a tremendous dowser he was the uh, chairman of the british society of dowsing so as well as the aromatherapy i was lucky enough to be taught all about the aura the chakras um, medical astrology and medical dowsing and as the years went on, I developed a strange talent of being able to hear the essential oils singing as musical notes. And then eventually I would hear the plants speaking as if they were people. Um, and that's what I write my books about. So I've written 20 books, the majority of which are um, for professional aromatherapists as deep dives into as many aspects of an essential oil as we can. And in 2018, Gergle, Halodi and I, that's the guy that I did the cards with, we decided one board afternoon in January, we were a bit sick of listening to just the same old, same old. And we decided what we really wanted to do was to create an online summit for professional aromatherapists. And it was the first online summit for professional therapists. 
which took place at the end of 2018. And I um, learned from, I videoed, but I learned from 60 of the best aromatherapists in the world. It was the most spellbinding of experiences. But after I was completely exhausted at the end of it, I was left with one overpowering question. Why? when all the best aromatherapists in the world had spoken about what they wanted to, why hadn't anyone wanted to talk about pain? And that was really confusing to me because apart from its actions on um, emotions, pain is the best thing we are. You know, we do pain so well, analgesia, and not one person had wanted to talk about it. And so I asked a couple of people and they all said, oh, it's very difficult to back up though, isn't it? And I thought, is it? Is it? So I decided to do some research and I went and studied with some pain therapists at the University of uh, at Oxford University at um, the University of Chicago and the University of M Michigan. I drew all of the information that I learned from those. The courses that I did were designed for people who were advanced practitioners supporting the GP as specialists. Uh, people for uh, rheumatism and arthritis and at the end of it I thought I've learned a bit but I knew most of this already so I decided to put it together into a structure to teach professional aromatherapists how to treat pain and so the professional pain practitioner was born but in that we focus on 24 oils and I thought well why why has Melissa kept coming up for pain? Because I wouldn't have used it for pain. I got, well, I work with 450 oils. I could think of a million better than, than, than Melissa for pain. Why does that keep coming up? And so I thought, when I finish this, that's what I'm going to look at. So true to myself, I went to the herbals and I kept coming up with the same piece of information that the ancient Greek priestesses of Demeter were called Melissa. That's what it says in all the herbal medicine about Melissa. That was the only fundamental thing that kept coming up. Why? Who are they? What do they do? Well, those who know me well will know those questions cannot be left unsearched. And I thought, right, well, if I know what they knew, what would I know then? <laughs> so that was the start of the plan. So those of us, who perhaps have never seen Melissa, I'm sure that you have, but let me just see if I can put my slideshow on. Uh, here is a Melissa plant. It's very pretty. Tiny, tiny white flowers on big green leaves. So the interesting thing is if you know anything about the doctrine of signatures, Anything with white leaves is ruled by the moon and Artemis is considered the moon. So that was tantalizing to me. And most of the places said the reason why they were called, why um, Melissa actually is the Greek word for bee. And the reason why it was called Melissa it was because bees loved it. Well, I'm going to bust that for you because four years down the line, I've watched that plant every single day. And my bees, my personal bees that I have learned to take care of and my bumblebees don't give a monkey's fig about <laughs> Melissa. They love the mint. They love the marjoram. They love the thyme. They will give that a wide berth. So that was confusing to me. And I didn't believe for a second that it could be wrong but it was obviously being construed long, wrongly somewhere along the line. So this pain thing, this pain thing sat with me for a long, long time. How do we explain this pain thing? Well, the course in itself is designed to tackle chronic pain. Acute pain is different. Acute pain happens because we've broken our leg, we've dropped something on our toe, we've had an operation and the scar tissue. But chronic pain is often, it might be because there's a, a condition, an underlying condition like rheumatism or, or arthritis or a bad back. But might also be no reason 
at all. You might have had a CAT scan, you might have had an MRI scan, you might have fibromyalgia. Um, and these awful problems in, um, in the body that seem to have no organic explanation whatsoever. And this is where the, the joy of Melissa comes in. So those of you who are writing notes, put your pens down, you'll never follow this bit in a million years. <laughs> Take it slowly. So I, we were interested in what's called the TRPV channels, trans receptor vanilla proteins, or the way around, protein vanilla. Um, and the best way of describing these is they modulate temperature, but they also modulate pain. So imagine that you have a big wood burner at home, a big fire, you know you shouldn't touch it, but somehow you do, do manage to touch it by accident and you immediately go, ow, 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 ow. Then your hands come away so, so quickly, your brain told it to come away faster than the feeling, but what you're left with afterwards is the throbbing, throbbing pain. So each nerve in the body has a different um, layer layering of myelin. Myelin is an, um, an insulating sheath. And the C fibers are what carry the dull pain of chronic pain. So they are the, oh, you stupid cow, it's still hurting. Why did you touch it? It's kind of, I always say it's the, it's the molecule of regret. You know, oh, I really should have known better than that, but I did do it, oh, you know, and it carries on and over and over. This dull pain that we have with chronic pain is all executed through the C fibers of the body. Now the C fibers are very interesting in their own right because they kind of work like a gateway. So halfway along the fiber they split like that and providing you have the right neurotransmission what will happen is it will go through and it will say danger, 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 danger. If you have the wrong neurotransmission, it goes to a different part of the brain and goes pain, 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 pain. The neurotransmission that makes that difference is GABA. And GABA is the calming neurotransmitter in the body. So as long as we have a sufficient GABA and enkephalins, and if you don't know what an enkephalin is, imagine endorphins. I think most of us know what endorphins are. The, an enkephalin is the same thing, but in the brainstem and in the spine. So the endorphins are in the periphery of the body, the rest is in the brain. So as long as there's enough enkephalins and enough GABA at the synapse, it will go danger and stress rather than pain. Obviously, if we are in a state of stress or anger or grief or unhappiness or trauma, what happens is the levels of GABA go down. So this is why somebody who has fibromyalgia really should not get stressed because as soon as the GABA level goes down, you have this hypersensitization in the body, which translates as dreadful pain. The reason why Melissa was coming up so often was because it has this incredible triptych of actions on the receptor. And what I mean by that is it works in three different ways to ensure that the GABA levels stay good. So what it will do is it will increase the amount of GABA in the body. It also increases the number of receptors that are available to catch the GABA as it comes across. And for those of you who don't know anything about neurotransmission, we're going to talk about something called the synaptic gap. So when a nerve signals to another nerve, this is the presynaptic and the postsynaptic, there is a gap between them. So we have an electrical signal, then a space and then another electrical signal. This space here is what's called the synaptic gap. And what happens is, this is where the chemicals are. And they are sent out from the end of the nerve called a bouton, 
The bouton's like a cupboard, in effect, that is full of neurotransmitters. So that sends neurotransmitters across the gap and hopefully gets caught on the postsynaptic nerve on the receptor. The fact that we've got more receptors and more GABA to go across is very helpful. But if in some cases people um, find that there is neurotransmitters left within the synaptic gap. So the easiest way to imagine that is if you take antidepressants, you have selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. This does the same thing with GABA. It stops the GABA being reuptaken so it can be recycled. That sounds like a bad thing, but what it means is slowly they can trickle across and eventually find their way to the receptor, which means all told we have a great deal of help at that receptor to keep the levels of pain down. What's interesting, though, is when you look at it from a full perspective, none of that's in the essential oil. So you can explain it. But the contradiction is it's modulated by um, a molecule called rosmarinic acid. And rosmarinic acid, thank you to a lady called Nina Glavatch who put me uh, right. She's a tremendous chemist. And she said, rosmarinic acid's too big to be in the essential oil. So whilst we see the effects happening, it's not because of any chemical within the um, essential oil. It's solely happening through some kind of action on the brain through the limbic, um, through the limbic system. And olfaction is extremely important, of course, that's the whole point of, ar of aromatherapy. And we should be very careful to not discount it because we haven't got the scientific evidence. Because remember that when somebody looks to find out what's happening in essential oil the researcher wants to know it because he's seen it happening over and over and over again what we find is even with the essential oil even though it cannot be proved because the rosmarinic acid doesn't pass through it you will still see this action on uh, GABA you still have this beautiful sense of joy and gratitude and feeling better in your life so it's fascinating what we do know is, and I'm going to say lemon balm now, because of course, Melissa officinalis is lemon balm. It becomes less complicated to keep saying Melissa, as we have so many meanings for it as we go on. Lemon balm, the herb, is digestive. It's anti-diabetic. It has profound effects on memory, especially in combination with lavender, for insomnia, menstrual problems, postnatal, and emotionally balancing. Now, I haven't put, ah, I've missed something off, cold sores. Cold sores is actually one of the only things that we have actual scientific evidence for it helping on a, on a topically as an essential oil. Most of the um, trials that have been What's the word? Conducted, not committed, conducted, have been done using what's called a hydro hydroalcoholic extract or an aqueous extract that are not essential oils. However, essential oil in tiny, tiny dilutions have got fantastic effects clinically proven on uh, cold sores. What's also incredibly well proven is its action on memory and particularly for diabetes. Um, when you read the book, I hope that you read the book, I will I put a health warning on the on the um, I've said diabetes, I mean dementia, it's coming to me. Um, I put a health warning on the dementia section. It's very, very upsetting to read. Um, they measured it using not only scales on people who had dementia, but also the carers and the effect that it was having on the carers with dementia. And it asks things like, how often have they spit at you? How often have they pulled your hair? 
How often have they kicked you? How often have they said uh, things are inappropriately sexual? How often have they disrobed themselves in public? It's really, really upsetting. But the Melissa does incredible things. You can see a real measured difference using the Melissa essential oil simply as an inhalant to calm them, to make them feel less confused, to help them sleep more for this inappropriate behavior dropping. However, not on its own. Oddly, it performs way better if it's blended with lavender and that's cl clinically proven. And so the simplest thing of just putting a drop of Melissa oil and a drop of lavender on a flannel and inhaling was literally transforming these people's lives. And even thinking about it now, it's making me feel like I want to tear up because it's really upsetting reading the things that those people were struggling with. They were deeply, deeply upsetting. Insomnia, I don't need to explain to you, you inside out, it's, it helps. What's really interesting though, is one of the things that the Melisse, the priestesses were involved in, is they, is in ancient Greek, was, Greek, was dream incubation. Helping you to understand your dreams, how um, the psychology comes through in dreams. And one thing that I will say to you is doing that work really brings a lot of psychology up, a lot of nightmares. Melissa essential oil brings the nightmares down very, very quickly. So if you've got a little one who has nightmares, it's really helpful. Um, menstrual. Now, menstrual, of course, we would use essential oil. However, the trials were done with lemon balm tea. And of course, it's, uh, essential oil is vastly expensive. Lemon balm tea is pence, you know, and it was found that it, it was equally as effective on menstrual problems as methanamic acid. So methanamic acid has loads and loads of horrible, horrible side effects, vomiting, nausea, headaches, some people epileptic fits, and the tea was doing just as good a job on its own. One of the um, loveliest trials was on uh, postnatal depression. And they um, monitored um, 20 ladies, as I recall, on their baby blues. And there was just one lady in the, in the 20 ladies that had the um, Melissa. And that was, a, that was a Melissa extract, so not an essential oil, but I would still say use it for postnatal depression. Um, she just had one half day that was blue, whereas the others, half of the people without the um, Melissa had got really profound, you know, issues with postnatal blues, not depression. But of course, that's how postnatal depression starts. But most of all, big subject, small word, emotionally balancing. That's where it's key, where it really is an important oil. So here we have the earliest, I think, representation of these priestesses. This is um, a Minoan seal from Crete. And if you look carefully, look, they have these amazing skirts on and they are ecstatic. But look closely, they have bee heads, bee hands and bee feet. And at the bottom, you'll see that Coming out of the crocuses, there are also some snakes. So the bee priestesses are bee shamans who also work with snake energy and black widow spider energy. So the question is, how do I know that? So I had presumed that since they were ancient Greek priestesses, they were gone. But actually, what happened when the, uh, the sanctuaries were closed in 392 AD by the Roman Emperor Theotidus? He closed down all the pagan sanctuaries and demanded that the world became Christian. They went into witness protection. 
what happened was they moved up into Scandinavia, which is why you see similar mythology in Scandinavia as you do in Greece and Rome. And then they headed down into Lithuania and to Latvia. Christianity didn't find its way to Lithuania till around about the 16th century. Um, and even then it was only in urban space in the rural community, bee shamanism is still very much alive and kicking. And uh, this is how I've trained to become a bee shaman and to learn what a Melissa is. These are the original snake, snake priestesses believed to be the Melissa. And as you can see, the middle one has that same skirt on as the Oz flick pack. So you can see, see how it's layered. There we go. So another um, famous um, statuette was found, an ivory one with metal binding. However, it seems very likely that that was a forgery. These though are incredibly ancient priestesses. So we wonder, what on earth are they doing? The earliest representation of a Melissa was the priestess of Sibeli. She was um, a Turkish goddess of Anatolia, tremendously powerful goddess. And it was she who eventually would become Rhea, Demeter, Artemis, her... Um, name and qualities reflected down through the ages and she was said to be um, supported by priests called Gali who were um, eunuch priests who would cut off their members themselves, castrate themselves in the middle of the street and celebrated her, uh, her with corybantic ecstatic dancing and loud drumming and cymbals and indeed the drumming is um, a vital part of the shamanic journeying of course oh what naivety <laughs> oh wait a minute got it i want a sound on turn off mm. see if i can delete that that's it so i do know what that was saying then <laughs> Wait a minute, how do I go back to the, oh, you can see anyway. So these are two actual Demet uh, um, Melissa. So the first one on the left is a, a very powerful priestess called Nikeso of Prien. Her statue was found in Ionia about 25 kilometers from Melitus. Anything that begins with Mel, you can pretty much sniff honey around it. And she dates to around 300 to 250 BC. She is a priestess of Demeter Core. The fact that we know that her, her name shows the sheer status of the woman, because only two types of, pre, of people were allowed to have their names put onto statues. The first were great warriors like Achilles, and great, well, centurions are Roman, but, you know, that sort of level of military and the highest of priestesses. So Nikeso was once profoundly important lady. And the priestess of Demeter is like the second most important priestess in the whole of Greece. The most important was the priestess of Athena Polias. She basically controlled Athens and the realm. But uh, the priestesses of Demeter were in charge of the Eleusinian mysteries, the most powerful and important of the, of the religious festivals and initiation that stood for 2000 years. And if you allow that number to sit with you, 2000 years is as long as we have had Christianity. So although this is bizarre stuff, and mark my words, the more you learn about it, the more bizarre you realize, it was the main religion. They were the mystery, uh, the mystery priestesses. The one on the left is what we call Kista Foros. Kista is the basket, the basket's on a head. You may notice that the basket looks like a bee skep and you may draw conclusions about what might be in there. 
what we do know is that what were in, was in the kist was the sacred objects and the pre the, the kist of Oros would be or the canny Oros led the procession to eleusis for the for the um, mysteries of eleusis 14 kilometers with that on her head can you imagine where are we here we go now the other important people we should know that are Melissa were perhaps the most famous the oracles the oracles were Melissa so as I say Melissa means B and she is Melissa Delphis and she this this is um a 19th century pa painting, but probably the most uh, famous version of the uh, picture of the oracles. But it's rather more chaste than she would uh, she would have been. What she's sitting on there is a tripod, and the smoke that's coming up we now know is from a vault in the ground. It's um, a, a, where the uh, meeting of two tectonic plates, and it's ethylene. And it was believed that she sat over the umphalos, which is a beehive, and believed to be the navel of the world. And within the umphalos is snakes, Delphine and Typhon, two snakes. And underneath that is Apollo. And it was believed that the Apollo, the god of prophecy, would breathe the prophecy into the into the Melissa's vagina. Now, the Melissa um, magic, we'll use the word magic work, is uh, the best uh, description. Is they are womb shamanesses. So that in itself is fascinating, given that we have been talking about uh, postnatal depression. We've been talking about Melissa as a um, medicine for premenstrual tension and uh, bad periods. What they did was they had these tremendous um, meditations or what they do, because this is what I've learned to do. These tremendous meditations that strengthen the womb as many things and in the context of this lady as the oracular vessel to draw up the chthonic energy of the of the earth and to use it to sustain and purify the woman's vagina so that she and her womb so that she becomes this tremendous oracle and shapeshifter and weaver this incredibly magical person and it was said that if they could control their nectary and we mean nectary with a k which is all of their power centers within their body they began to drip many fluids including ecor which was the which which was said to be flowing within the bodies of the gods and as such then this work with melissa as a melissa and with the focus on the womb and visualizations on what we say is the roses and stars as different uh, energy centers not quite chakras but best understood like the chakras then they could control these endocrine glands in particular ways and most startlingly, it was believed that they could dis they could choose whether the sperm met the egg. Now, what's odd is if you look at the at the history, it doesn't say anywhere that they understood how fertilization took place. In fact, it's not really until the 19th century that it's written clearly. But if you consider that there are three different types of bee in a hive. There is the queen bee, a worker bee, or we call them maidens, and a drone. The queen bee is this hypersexual queen who goes on a maiden flight and is impregnated or inseminated so many times that she never needs to go out again. And she can choose whether she lays a fertilized egg or a um, 
unfertilized egg. So a fertilized egg becomes a worker bee, a, a maiden. If it's an unfertilized egg that she lays, it's a drone. So you might consider for a moment, I will be quiet in a moment, what that means that when you have a virgin birth, you have a boy. Now what's strange is in a, a hive situation, the hive is happy as long as it is queen right. That means that the queen is lame, but if the queen dies for some reason or she becomes ill, then the workers take an ordinary fertilized egg feed it, gorge it on royal jelly. So it becomes a different creature. It becomes a queen bee, a hypersexual queen bee. But in the meantime, they have to lay themselves and they've never had, never been inseminated. So they lay their children without ever having been inseminated. And so this is where we see the beginnings of the cult of divine birth. These women who were said to be goddesses who could have virgin births. And so these people, these women are not priestesses of Donita. They are priestesses of Artemis. The priestess of Artemis was chaste for one year. And uh, we hear about the Vestal Virgins, but they shouldn't be confused. The Vestal Virgins are Roman and they were tied to 30 years of chastity. However, in Greece, only one year, which is interesting because one year also aligns to a different type of bee, not a honeybee. This is a solitary bee. And what's fascinating, I won't go too much into it because the layers are really incredible, but you can tell by the way that somebody's been buried, how the priestess was buried, what kind of priestess she was. So there is um, a site called Orthi Petra, which is on uh, in Crete. There's a famous necropolis where there's been an awful lot of jewels, etc., found that have been got bees everywhere, everywhere in this cult. And these women have been, these priestesses, they were found with great inordinate amounts of wealth. They were buried in these big amphorae, in big jars, laid, sing, uh, like posting into each other in the tube, so like that, which is exactly how the solitary bees lay their eggs. And they put everything in there with them, all the royal jelly, and then they die and the babies come next year, um, completely looked after. And these tombs of these virgin priestesses are exactly as the solitary bee lays her eggs. It's very, very creepy, <laughs> but, but really interesting to see. And there is a third type. Of course, we can't have, we can't have bees without the queen bee. And it took me a very, very long time to verify that the, that the priestesses of Aphrodite were also called Mel Melisai. I'm not sure whether they were in Greece. Certainly they were in Sicily. It was said that at the um, site in Eryx, which is on uh, in Italy, that the priestesses of Aphrodite were called Melisai and that they would lay honeycomb on the altar because honey was her fetish. Well, that sounds very bee-like, bee and it took a long time, but it is right, it is right. It's not, it's hard to pin it down, but it is right. So she is the hypersexual queen. So by, on one hand, we have these chaste bees, and then we have this hypersexual queen. And this is really the fundamental part where we kind of start to come into communion with aromatherapy because we have this tremendous imagery of how the the bee we, we say is the the bee the genital of the flower or the flower the genital of the bee you know the, the flower cannot be fertilized most of them you know we can wind fertilize but most of them have to have this beautiful union where this bee absolutely blisses out within the flower writhing in the pollen and the pollen contains all of the DNA of that plant and the area. And she drinks up all of that knowledge of the plant. And then she takes it back 
to the hive. Now, actually, the bee, the queen bee doesn't do that. Her job is entirely just go up to the sky, have sex, come down, lay eggs. But in the time she's gone up to the sun and she's always in continual um contact with her beautiful um, attendants they feed her all the time because she's too busy she can't eat and she has to have different food to everybody else so she has these attendants which in Greek mythology you can easily see is the chariots the graces they are the ones that attend the priestess and as they touch her they take her uh, scent around the hive now for a while I thought that was the Melissa but it's not there is another hormone called Nazanoff, which is secreted around the hive. And when you look at the chemistry of Nazanoff and you look at the chemistry of Melissa, they are identical. And what Nazanoff is, is they secrete it around the hive to say, we're happy. When they go out onto the flowers, they say, we've been here, we've been here, we've been here. Don't do this one, we've done this one, we've done this one. But more importantly, when the newbies go out, do you like newbies? Newbies go out on their training flight. The bees go and they stick their bums in the air and they secrete it off and say, this is home, this is home, follow me, follow me, follow me. And that's what's going into the air. That must be why they're called Melissa because that bees do love the scent of Melissa. It's the same, but it's not the plant. In fact, in some ways, the plant may well be a distraction because it smells the same as the hive. But they do say, if you rub lemon balm, if you rub Melissa on the inside of the hive, your bees will, no, will not swarm or leave you. Yet to see if mine are gonna do that. So one of the key things that these priestesses did with their work was dream work dream weaving, dream um, incubation. So here we have two very ancient symbols. We have the rod of Asclepius and the caduceus. And we can see a, a scene here from the actual temples. And we're told through many sources that these people would go and dream with Asclepius or indeed through on the, in the Egyptian, the god Serapis. Um, and incubate oracular knowledge about themselves, but also to bring healing and surrounded by snakes. What's interesting is they say that um, the temple of Asclepius was, they would lie amongst all of these snakes in this temple that was surrounded by Cyprus. And I kept thinking, I don't, I don't think I should go anywhere near Cyprus yet. I don't think I should go anywhere near Cyprus yet. And I was thinking, oh, it's going to be what I do next. It's definitely what I'm going to, I'm going to leave it there. I'm going to leave it there. And then this lady called Frances sent me these beautiful oils from Catalonia. And what did she, what did she send me? Of course she sent me Cyprus and a junkie like me was never going to leave the lid on. Oh my goodness me. Two days and I was surrounded by snakes. I was seeing them everywhere. Once you tap into the Cyprus energy, then you start to understand the serpent energy of the Melissa. So this Caduceus is a really, really famous uh, symbol. And you can see all my messages, I think, popping up on the bottom. Um, and this is a famous symbol for knowledge. It's the hermetic seal, but actually it's also the symbology of one of the Melissa meditations called the serpent flight of the bumblebee. And it is how they journeyed. Um, and as I say, we, what they were working towards was to get this ma the mastery of the nectary. So the nectary is, we have seven um, chakras in Eastern medicine, don't we? In the uh, Western tradition, there are eight different energy centers that I'm not gonna go into. These belong to other people to teach, um, but there's eight, which we say are roses and stars. And working with these, we start to really focus on the health of different glands. So the, the, um, the endocrine system becomes so, so clever that we can lay eggs if we want to. We could 
make wax if we want to in the in the metaphor but actually it means that we can do extraordinary things and bizarrely without recognizing that i was even doing it if you look at the ancient the ancient herbals about uh melissa one of the most prolific writers about it is paracelsus in the 16th century and he talks about how he made this uh alchemical spagyric of Melissa and he called it the elixir of life. He said it was going to, it would um, heal anything that happened to a man. And he told a story about how he'd tried it on his cockerel and his cockerel had lost all its feathers. They'd all fell out and then they'd all grown back much, much better. So he thought, right, okay, well, I'm gonna try this on a woman. So he tried it on this woman and all her nails and her toenails fell out and she started to look considerably younger, but she was really quite frightened by how dramatic the effects were. Well, I have obviously been using Melissa for a long, long time in different ways, in teas, in massage oils, in everything. And two years after my, I've gone through my menopause, I bled like you've never seen. 13 days, so, so heavily, no pain, no bloating, no PMT. It was like the dead, the Red Sea gushed out of me. And I ended up actually having to go and have a biopsy on my womb and a camera put in. And they said, we have absolutely no explanation as to why you suddenly started to bleed again. I thought, I do. I do. Um, so I just wanted to show you these. These are the first of our aromatherapists. These are the nymphs. And Artemis is said to have had 60 nymphs who uh, helped her in her duties of healing and childbirth. She was um, obviously the herbalist. So these two are nymphs. We can see that one has a drum. The other has an incredibly strange stick. And this stick is what we call in the tradition a distaff. So distaff can be used to, for spinning, but also for shape-shifting and merging and getting the information from the tree. So there we are. There's our first um, site of the earliest herbalists. And just a couple of other images. I talked about how... Um, the Asclepius Dream Center was also in Egyptian. They had Serapis or Osiris Apis, and he was believed to bring the dreams. And the bees were the bringers of dreams, but bees were always also the bringers of new souls and the souls and took away the souls of the dead. And this is Osiris Apis, and he was the part of Osiris that was his spirit that would work with Osiris and the Pharaoh after the Pharaoh had died to bring back the sun every day and to perpetuate the lives of the dead. And that's profoundly connected to this idea of the souls with the dead and the bees. So, well, I've taken up an hour, which is obviously my usual way of doing things. Now, I wanted to do a bit of a, a, a Melissa meditation with you, but I would also like to answer questions. So if you would tell me which you would prefer, that would be helpful to me. Well, I'm up for a meditation. What about the rest of you? Liz, I can't even begin to tell you. I feel so nauseous right now. I feel like I'm about to throw up. It's dizzying. And my girlfriend who's here with us right now, she's saying the same. I'm just like, oh, my gosh, what's going on? Welcome to my world. Oh. <laughs> it's been really dizzying, hasn't it? And But yeah. actually, the best thing that I can say to you now is go and get some Melissa because you are, what's happening is I've drawn you into the hive and the Melissa will stabilise you. Yeah, so there's a few people feeling weird and dizzy. Tired? Is anyone else feeling tired all of a sudden? I'm like wiped out. I was fine a minute ago. So yes, I have I have it. I have Melissa here. So I'm just I'm, I'll keep working with her. But I'm up for meditation. Who else is up? Oh, we, we need to be careful. Then. If you're feeling dizzy, because what I don't want to do is make it worse. 
Uh, I think just one person said dizzy. I'm tired, not dizzy. Okay. Um, well, we'll do, we'll, we won't do a deep meditation then. I will just show you a little bit of the different medicine because it's very different to anything that you will have done before. Gorgeous. Do you want to take it off screen, share? And then yeah, we'll so, yeah. yeah, so we will. And in fact, all of you take it off screen. Actually, how do I take myself off screen? I'll you just, screen you just share. say stop share. Yep, that's, that's it. it. Yeah, and that's so it. then yeah. stop video. Perfect. Everyone's loving it, though. No, you want you keep your video on. No, I don't want to keep my video. No, everybody put your videos off, please. So. When you learn Melissa medicine, it's never been written down. It belongs in oral record. And we do what's called knowledge lectures. So we shouldn't ever take any uh, notes in a, a knowledge lecture. We think about how the bee brings the pollen from so many different plants into the hive with so many different stories attached to them. And they pass it to another bee and they regurgitate that information, passing it backwards and forwards, backwards and forwards until it becomes this beautiful honey, honeyed wisdom, honeyed lessons about the environment, honeyed moments hidden in the hive. And the wisdom lands like honey. And it was said that the bees were the bringers of honeyed lips and that poets and dreamers and musicians had been kissed by the honey of a bee. And so as we meditate, we bring our uh, awareness down from the headspace, down to the place where it's the center of all knowledge of everyone, every woman who has ever worked within the hive. So we begin by letting our breath slowly drift through time as if we were on the waves of the sea, drifting gently, almost as if there were no barriers, no time, no space, nothing to do but absorb the light of the sun. And as we focus on the sun above us, we draw our attention down, down, down into the womb space, into the cave, the chthonic earth energy. And there we feel how the cauldron mixes all the information of every woman who has ever put information into the hive. And we focus our mind on the shape of our womb and imagine the fallopian tubes that come through it. We picture the shape as a womb space, regardless of whether we've had hysterectomies or if we were a man. This, this space, this organ, organ no longer used, this is the centre of our power. Consider how the shape of your womb with the fallopian tubes echoes the shape of the bee's head. And we think about the proboscis that goes into the flower and absorbs all of the goodness, all of the tastes of the history of the land and takes it back to the hive and rubs itself on other flowers, perpetuating the story of the world. 
and consider this bee's head. See the proboscis going down, down, down into the earth, into the chthonic realms, down through the earth's mantle to right at the center of the earth, to the ball of fire in the underworld where Persephone lives. And there we draw up all of the energy of the fire of the center of the earth. And we listen to whisperings that take place within the hive, a hum, a buzz, sensations in our body as we feel the vibrations of others whispering to us. We feel how the bees waggle dance around us, telling us where the honey is, where the nectar, where the beautiful pollen of the information of all of the land resides, connecting us through time to those who worked with the bees before. And so draw up all of the wisdom from Persephone. She, the guardian of those of, who have stepped out of their mortal sheath to the other side to support us in this work. And know that even though a bee may sting you, it always works for your own good. Beneficent medicine that crawls along the meridians, healing, cleansing, lifting, connecting you to the ley lines of the earth and making you the genital of the earth. And with that, allow the proboscis to come back, slowly drawing up all the energy. And just for a moment, focus your energy on the first of the roses and stars, the perineum the secret, the place that engineers all of the wisdom of the Melissa. When you're ready, come back. Okay, you've had your first knowledge lecture. How did everybody find it? Thank you, Gillian. <laughs> you still feeling weirdness? I've been inhaling this through the whole meditation, so I'm starting to come back. Mm -hmm. It's not quite sitting there, ready to throw up. So yeah, I feel I'm feeling better, but I think I'm just going to just rest after this. Consider that the older bees are secreting that to you to help you in your training, because that is exactly what happens. 
in the height. Mm. And it's really interesting you talked about bleeding because I'm perimenopausal and I ha- I woke up yesterday, so the day before our, you know, beautiful session with you today with a full-blown bleed. Yep, yep, yep. <laughs> Thank you, ladies who are sending. Before we go, I'm obviously very conscious of time. Does anybody want to ask me anything? Because I know it's massively confusing, wide stuff. (laughs) How are you feeling? Did you feel like the meditation just harnessed a lot of that for you? You know, especially when we just allowed the proboscis to descend down into the earth and, you know, get to the core of the earth, the wound, so to speak, the fire. Oh, yeah, there's a few nods. <laughs> yeah, everyone's loving it, Liz. Thank you so much, sweetie. Does anyone want to come off mute? Okay, actually, what I'll do is I'll turn off the recording just so that it's private. I'll do a formal thank yeah, you. Yeah, that's a good idea. And then we'll, then we'll open the circle. So thank you so much, Elizabeth, for being here with us, for sharing this wisdom with us. It was profound. Um, I too work with the song of the plants and hear them as well as as a as a being, as you know. And and yet, I feel like no matter how we work, no matter what we receive, there's always another gift to unpack with someone else. There's always a transmission that we're ready for. And I feel like we were ready for Melissa now. And the world is ready for for the light that can be brought through as you undergo initiation of this magnitude. You know, I, I, do, I think that I, I think that's absolutely right. But I also think that the world now needs to understand on a deeper level totally. the importance yeah. of the pollinators, the, the things that we're not seeing that we don't see in the ordinary world, but that we are just stepping away from, particularly as women. I have a yeah. host, hope you're watching. <laughs> that's true. Oh. So, yes, I agree with you. And, and you know, when the world can open up to that, then, you know, we will come to peace. So um, do you want to pop your your website in the chat, please? And yes, I will. will put, um, I'll pop, I have a book as well that I've written. For those that are interested, I'll pop that in the chat as well in a second. Um, I would like put, to tell you, I would like to tell everybody how much I love Vanessa's book. And... I think in a world where there's an awful lot of science going on and not much esoteric, Vanessa and Adam's book is beautiful and I would heartily recommend it to anyone. Uh, You are so sweet. Thanks, Liz. It's called Gifts of the Essentials and it definitely dives into the, the spiritual, the metaphysical. We go into a lot of the lore the mythology and, of course, channeled, channeled pieces of what we've received from, from the plants. There's over 100 essential oils in this, this particular book. So that's it there. And, um, Liz, you've popped your email. Perfect. That's wonderful. Yeah, and if anybody wants the cards as well that she was working from, there is a link to the cards and all my books through my website. Okay, and I have at Food Alchemy is my Insta handle. Come pop over there. I love sharing yumminess there. So come and see me there. I'm going to stop the recording, but thank you, thank you, thank you, Liz. We all thank love you, you everybody. so much. And we're going to Q&A together.